March 27, 1996, the town of Pahala in the Kau district of the Big Island of Hawaii. Feel sad. See the sugar company for uh, phasing out, you know. After all these years, we've been in business. Can't do nothing about it. After more than a century, sugar is shutting down. If there's a job over around here, probably I would be coming back again because this is my home. So I grow up. Hundreds of people losing their jobs. This day is their last. I'm going to miss all the guys. Every now and then I see guys in the street and they remember that time and remember this time. And it, it, I miss all the, the chattering with the guys out there. Hi. So let's do it. My name is Cliff Watson. I'm a freelance cameraman from Honolulu, and I work in television and video production. I came to Pahala to record some images of the sugar plantation and mill before it closed, and hopefully to get some of the stories of the workers' lifestyles which have been molded over time by this industry. It's hard. It, it was hard for me. I, I felt sad that we were in town. It, it's just one of those things. He died an agonizing death, but sugar served its purpose for the 120 something years that it was in existence. Sad to see an era go, but changing times, <laughs> gotta move on to something else. Audrey, my wife, grew up in Ka'u. She still has family here, so we try to visit as much as we can. My first visit to Pahala was about 13 years ago. The more I learned about Pahala, the more the history of the sugar town fascinated me. Over the years, I realized that I wanted to document the changes taking place here, to preserve with my camera the passing of a lifestyle in Hawaii before it disappeared. When every mill has been built, they brought a photographer in to photograph it when it's brand shiny new. Everything's glistening, all the, all the chrome is polished and all the steel is, is painted. So you've got all these photographs and history in the archives and, and everywhere of all the mills looking like that. There's a tradition of the funeral photographer making a picture of the deceased in their coffin. So in a way, I think of myself as this photographer in relation to the death of sugar in Hawaii. Franco Samoiragi's photographic documentary projects have focused on preserving contemporary Hawaiian events and history in isolated communities throughout the islands. He has photographed the people and places of Waipio Valley on the Big Island 
Kipuhulu Maui, Kalau Papa Molokai, and the island of Koho'olawe. Franco and I were working together on another project when I told him that I was documenting the closing of Kau Sugar. Franco lived on the Big Island for 10 years and had photographed the town of Pahala and the mill in the early 1970s. He decided to join me on subsequent trips to Pahala and together we photographed the community. It's a very poignant time in history with this whole thing, with the people losing their jobs, the mill closing, and really the end of a, a really important era in Hawaii. It's been you know, over 100 years. 13 mills here, this is the last one. So I felt a lot of excitement, you know, as a photographer. Franco and I started out together, sometimes photographing the same thing. At other times, we went off in separate directions. We wanted to record as much as possible. In a matter of time, this all would be gone. Regardless of why the sugar industry is phasing out, the people of this community are going to miss the only way of life they have known for over a century. Sugar meant jobs for workers and profits for owners. With the immigrants who came to work in the fields came cultural diversity. These immigrants brought their own traditions and disrupted the native Hawaiian community that lived there before sugar moved in. In 1858, there were only seven so-called foreigners in all of the Kau district, but then the Americans began to arrive. By 1870, they had acquired land, built homes for their families, and constructed mills. And with the first harvest, the sugar industry was born. My grandfather came from Portugal, and he worked in a sugar company. And my father started when he was 14 years old. He worked for 51 years. I'm third generation. My uh, dad's parents came from Japan, and they uh, first, they, uh, I guess they came in with a ship in Hilo, and they went to La Poyoroi, and they worked there in a the, uh, sugar cane field. This was a land of opportunity. So he came over here, and he had, they, from what I understand, they had a three-year contract. They signed with a plantation. Within the three years, you would make enough money to go back to Japan. But uh, <clears throat> so he worked hard. In the meantime, the three years came about. He wasn't able to do, so he called for his wife. For 125 years, sugar meant work for generation after generation. Well, that was security. That was security, you know. Um, if you got into the plantation at that time, you got it made. The sugar plantation had brought Audrey's grandfathers to Kau from Japan as contract laborers. By the time her parents' generation, the Nisei, were born, the number of workers peaked. That was the 1920s, when Pahala was a thriving town, people working hard and living by their strong beliefs, values, and cultural traditions. The basic foundation is a family, and like my parents used to stress the work ethic. In other words, you give an honest day's work, and you know, you be truthful, you know. And we, we've tried, my wife and I, we've tried to instill that in our children. From the time I, you know, I was born and uh, raised in Kau, and uh, you know, when I started to go to school, maybe from eight, eight years old, all the way up. I, we didn't have no problem with uh, different uh, nationalities, you know. We always uh, were together. It was a time and place where trust and honor had meaning. I mean, you gotta have integrity, because if you don't have that, I, I, I think uh, you have problems. The people's memories basically are very positive. And so it's very interesting. They remember basically the good times. That's the thing that sticks with me the most, that everybody remembers the good part. Uh, it's been very rare that you get a negative uh, uh, comment about life. Okay. Uh, one more, let me take one more, make sure I get a good one of both of you. OK, she's OK, yeah? Good, okay. thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Filipinos, Japanese, Koreans, Chinese, Hawaiian. Portuguese, we all had different camps. Yeah. We used to get uh, so many camps. They call this uh, Japanese milk camp down here. 
And there is a Korean camp way down this side. They used to get a, this is a Spanish camp, yeah? Yeah, yeah. And this is the Korean camp up here, you know. Mm. And where we live, as the new Japanese camp, they used to get up here. This road here that leads up right in front here, goes up. When you pass the, uh, the last house you see up there, that slope up there used to be Spanish, a camp of Spanish people, imported laborers, contract laborers who are Spanish. That's why they call that this the Spanish camp, this area. With the company housing divided by ethnicity, the plantation camps were communities of immigrants where the final generation of sugar workers grew up. We live in a small community there. We had some kind of activities. We like to beat these people here in a bigger town. <laughs> that kind of competition you get. So even all nationality feels that. We, we play for our community in Kapapala. You know, we like to beat these people in Pahala. <laughs> That's the kind of feeling we had when we were young. Yeah. Play baseball, mm. basketball, yeah. all sport yeah, activities. Sports. For that matter, even the Filipino people used to, they love to play volleyball. Yeah, all oh, the camp, know. camp. Eh? So they have a team of the Filipino to challenge the, all the camps are there. Deeping camps. Yeah. We had only one police over here and um, we he had only one eye, cop had only one eye, but he caught all the crooks because he knew everybody in Pahala. His car, I mean, if you've seen his car, was only second gear. <laughs> but, you know, all you can hear is car whining. When he stopped, you know somebody was in trouble. We had practically everything. We had a movie theater, you know what I mean, that uh, before uh, the American type uh, talkies came in, they had a Japanese type talkies where a man would be sitting there and he'd uh, narrate right through the show. Every Saturday night in the old days, every Saturday night, there was a movie night. And next to that theater is a bank, Bank of Hawaii. So it was a rounded out community. You know, we had a bank, we had a theater, we had stores, we had a courthouse, we had a jail in the back. It was a rounded out community with, a, as I said, a hotel. You know, it was a two-story thing. And the bottom was a bar and a restaurant. And the cowboys used to come from Kapapala Ranch every Fridays. And when I was a kid, I used to hang around there because the cowboys would go in and drink, and then they'd have a fight. And they'd come outside, wrestle around, and then we'd pick up all the loose change because, you know. being here uh, with the mill shut down, being very quiet. It was eerie in the mill after the shutdown. It was quiet with very few people around. We came across a group of workers removing their personal lockers. You guys on company time now, or are you working for yourself? Yeah, you're working for you know, whatever stuff you're supposed to take out of this bin. Just yesterday, this was a place where many people of this community worked. Today, it is so different. It's a strange feeling being here. It seems as if the spirit of the mill is gone. When we first came to the mill, this is sort of the portal. People come and go, would come and go here. Um, many people going in and out. And before the mill closed um, one afternoon at lunchtime, the, I guess the tradition, once a, every once in a while, the supervisors would give a luncheon party. for the workers. And Eddie Andrade, who we interviewed, was sort of in charge of it. He 
would set up these 50-gallon uh, drums that are cut in half, and they've made barbecues out of them, barbecue pits. And there'd be two or three of them set up. So to come here now and to see it looking like this, you know, it gives me goosebumps. It's really, it's just so different. There's so much that I've missed that I, I never thought I miss. I would miss the mill, but I do miss the mill. I miss working there. I love the environment there. I love the crew that I worked with. I love some of the bosses that I worked with. I miss them. In the factory, I, uh, I tried all kinds during the weekend. We used to shut down for the weekend. And I used to try all kinds of machines, you know. Nobody was around until finally I got caught. And then uh, the superintendent just, you know, chewed me out and said, uh, if you want to learn, come and see him and he'll do it properly. So. I went up and took him up on that, and then that's how I, I learned all the different stations, and then finally came supervisor. I've used my hands all my life. I'm a, mechanics is my fault. I've got a technique, to, uh, a feel for machinery that a lot of mechanics don't have. I can talk to the things, I can swear to them and make them work. <laughs> Because I was the only woman working there, I felt that, uh, I felt a little vibes from some of the men. But the elderly gave me confidence in myself. The elderly made me comfortable. Driving that cane truck and doing exactly what they did, there was some envy. I am scared. But I said, when we sit down and eat lunch with all these men, and I find out that they're just as scared as me, and it gave me more confidence in myself. And I says, I'm not feeling too bad. There's men that are afraid of this poly too. They're afraid of this mountain. You can say it was more dangerous, like all the heavy equipment. It was, you know, we handle and you know, all that. And responsible for. So every day that, you know, you go, you, you, you're thinking of, when you get to the job site, you're thinking for safety, because somebody can get hurt or killed or... When I got in the factory, I had more respect from them than I had from the cane truck drivers. I mean, the men were there for me, and they gave me confidence in myself, and they says, right on, Jan, you can do it, you can do it. I said, hey, more, I, went, I never get a big head. I just felt, hey, working with this man made me comfortable. You know, they, they treated me as an individual. Ko Sugar was the last commercial sugar company on the Big Island. The last survivors named like Na'alehu Sugar, Hilea Plantation, Hawaiian Agriculture, Wauhinu Plantation, and Hutchinson Sugar. Names that belong to generations past. I worked for this company 49 years. I was born and raised over here, <laughs> right in Ka'u. Uh, they call the Hilea way up the sticks up there. <laughs> yeah. Life has really changed though. <laughs> the, the sugar, that's the one that uh, keep our community up until today. You know, they're the one that the main thing for, for our living over here, you know. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy that we had this sugar production in our, our place. Without that, I don't know. Yeah, we depend on sugar all our life. Yeah. <laughs> it's all that many of these people have known. Yeah, that they've come here, they've grown up, they've worked, they've gotten married, they've had children, they've buried their parents, they've buried their children here. This is really their life. Yeah. They only pay, we're making $9 an hour, but life could be good. Your life isn't dictated by the almighty dollar. You know, you, you have your own paths that you follow, and if you want, I met that way, yeah? 
I think terrific living, huh? We're simple people, and we don't want too much drastic changes in Pahala. You know, we, we're just simple people that want to get take day by day kind of living, you know, and not the fast world. Audrey and I have always managed to get back to Pahala for the New Year's holiday. One visit, we were welcomed into several different homes to celebrate the New Year with traditional Japanese food and drink. On that day, we must have visited four homes. It's not like the olden days, you, you get so many uh, people Partner, yeah, get partners, together yeah. and, you know, they promote you whole day. Yeah. Those days, you, that, that was even our time, though. I know a lot of them went from house to house and, you know, and really partied and enjoyed themselves. Of course, I went along, too, but I would say those things were done more by people before my generation, in fact. You know, in our generation already, it was kind of slacking down where you'd go to maybe only two or three families, only to your close friends. But in the old days, they went to every house. As far as my family is concerned, like Steve, he insisted we do it. So my family, we get together, and then we pound our mochi, you know. And every New Year's, we all get together, my kids, you know, and uh, we still do that. Some cultural traditions last longer than others. People in Kau are friendly, but like people in other small towns, they are maybe a little suspicious of outsiders. When I started this project, I expected they'd welcome the idea of sharing their stories and lifestyle for posterity. But it was hard to get people to open up to the camera. The people, because we were so isolated by, by camps, they were very clannish, you know, they tried to be together. And uh, yeah, I think that still exists today. <laughs> we are isolated. <laughs> Nobody seems, you know, when you ask, when you tell them, oh, I'm from Paula. Paula? Where? Then you have to mention volcano. Oh, OK. Is it near Volcano? Yes, so many miles away from Volcano, you know. But we're really isolated. In a way, it seems that Pahala is even more isolated today. Over the years, many people have moved away to find jobs elsewhere. So when the last day of harvest came to Kau Sugar and the trucks rolled through the town of Pahala, it made news across the state. The final crops of Ka'u cane were processed under a sunless sky on a day some said was appropriately gray. Ka'u Agribusiness announced it would close its sugar division two years ago after union uh, members... remembers them in their splendor when he joined Ka'u in 1972. That's how it was when I was a news cameraman, going to the location, shooting the story, and getting back to the station in time for the news. But after spending time in Ka'u, I know the reality is more than just a 90-second news story. The people here realize they are facing a transition period, and many are ready for the challenge. Well, it's hard to see it go, because it's a lifestyle that I think a lot of us owe a lot to sugar. I mean, in varying degrees, maybe, but I still think we do owe a lot to sugar. I loved it. I love getting up, going to work, going to work. But I find I have to find myself to do other things to keep my mind off of it. It was, it's hard. It, it was hard for me. But I think we're still going through that transition period, and uh, things are in turmoil stage just now, yeah? <laughs> but I think it'll be for the better, though. For the better. When Cliff Watson and I decided to come photograph the Big Island's Kau district, we wanted to document with our cameras the transition of the sugar culture that has dominated this isolated community of Pahala for over 125 years. For us, it was an opportunity to be in Pahala at a moment of important social, cultural, and technological change, and to share that experience with the people who live here today. These video and still photographs will hopefully find their true value for the community in the years to come. Perhaps 50 years from now, the images will help those with family roots here to know their ancestors and their history. In the meantime, the people of Pahala must find solutions for the present. 
Some former sugar workers are trying their hand at farming small plots provided by Ka'u Agribusiness. Eddie Andrade and his brother Patrick have set up a landscape business, while others continue to search for what life holds after sugar.